No intro today, folks. We're going to be going over the after action review from the last few weeks, if not last few months of what happened during the rescue operation in Afghanistan, of which I was intimately involved with, as you know, having listened to some of the other Afghan updates. And uh, before I do so, I just want to uh, pay my respects to all those American servicemen and women lost during the Hamid Karzai Kabul airport suicide attack. So the names of the fallen are Marine Corps Lance Corporal Riley McCollum, Marine Corps Lance Corporal Jared M. Schmitz, Marine Corps Lance Corporal David L. Espinoza, Navy Hospitalman Maxton W. Soviak, Marine Corps Corporal Hunter Lopez, Marine Corps Lance Corporal Kareem M. Nikui, Marine Corps Staff Sergeant Taylor Hoover, Marine Corps Corporal Deegan William Tyler Page, U.S. Army Staff Sergeant Ryan Noss, Marine Corps Corporal Umberto A. Sanchez, Marine Corps Sergeant Johanny Rosario Pichardo, Marine Corps Sergeant Nicole L. Gee, Marine Corps Lance Corporal Dylan R. Marola. May they rest in peace. We will remember them. So, folks, if you're not tracking, that attack happened on the 28th of August, 2021, at the Abbey Gate. Now, the Abbey Gate was one of the main gates where Canadian interpreters and their families were told to go for extraction as a last-ditch effort to get on one of the last C-17s. We were alerted just in the nick of time from our intel on the ground that there is a potential suicide attack planned for this area. And thankfully, we managed to alert all of our families and all of those individuals that were told to go to that area to seek cover, seek shelter. And only minutes after getting that message out, The attack happened, and uh, luckily we we saved a lot of lives with that uh, real-time intel. Unfortunately, we lost the lives of 13 members of the American Armed Forces, and we're remembering them today. So where did this all come to a head? So we have a lot of questions, and I don't think we have enough answers. I'm going to go and explain just... From my perspective, what I saw, what I experienced, how I felt. And this hopefully will give you a little bit more context as to what we've been doing, what we've been up to, and and what we need to do moving forward. So according to the Canadian government's official numbers, we've rescued 3,700 Afghans. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any granularity into that data. I'm always skeptical of round numbers. According to our numbers, so the Afghan Canadian Interpreters Initiative, we had over 630 members on our list. From what we have been able to calculate, we have just under 20% of those individuals out of the country. So, therefore, there are a lot left because the average Afghan family has about five to six people in it. They have relatively large families. So how many have we left? We're not sure because we don't know based on the numbers how many of these individuals that have come here from Afghanistan and elsewhere are interpreters, are those that work for Canadian Armed Forces, are embassy staff, are Canadian citizens. We just don't know. And according to the government, we have 1,250 still stuck in Afghanistan. Again, a very round number. Again, I'm very skeptical of that because I'm sure it's much, 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 much more. Um, And the unfortunate reality is that during the chaos and the fact that our response was late, I don't think we're ever going to have a truly representative number. But that means we have to keep on fighting. We know the individuals that need help, and we are constantly, constantly keeping up the efforts to ensure that they have a lifeline, that they have somebody to talk to and that we try to find the best means possible for them to extract themselves from Afghanistan. So let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to the 16th of August. 
So if you were tracking the news, the 15th of August is when the Taliban entered into Kabul. This was somewhat surprising to the international community, but to us, we had eerily predicted that our end state, the, the absolute final or the, the last possible time that we could extract people, was mid-August. Now, it's not like we had any special intelligence. We just had a very strong feeling based on the reports that we were getting from Afghanistan, from the individuals that were on the ground in Afghanistan sending us daily sit reps, that the Taliban were moving a lot faster than everybody was predicting and that the government was going to fall a lot quicker than everybody was predicting. So unfortunately, this was true. Now, the 16th of August was a particularly devastating day because this was the day where basically the Taliban just overran the city. And we knew then, like, the chances of getting anybody out were going to be slim to none. And the, the feeling that was just so overwhelming was that we've let all of these individuals down. Their families are begging us now, get us out, get us out. I'm sure you saw the footage of Afghans holding on to the C-17s as they're taking off and falling to the deaths. Like that is how desperate they were to get out of this country, knowing full well what it was going to be like with the Taliban. And what was going through my head was just, you know, the, the family that was left behind of my interpreter that now is at the hands of the Taliban. You know, the numerous other families that we're in contact with that were just now at a loss. We didn't get them out. And that happened to be my daughter's birthday as well. And the, the two incongruities, the very happy moment that I was experiencing with my, my daughter's birthday and at the same time getting reports of, you know, save my life. Oh my God, you know, they're about to kill us. The, these, were, these were just, the, it, was, it, was, it was a terrible day. Let's just put it that way. There's a lot of tears that day um, and just a, a, lot of, a lot of hurt feelings. Let's just put it that way. However, there was a sliver of hope a few days later when we started seeing the government really kick things into high gear. We realized the Americans were doubling down to up their evacuations. This was the time that Canadian government decided, okay, we can get behind this. Let's start getting our flights in as quickly as possible. Let's get as many people out as possible. So we went into overdrive. Calls in the middle of the night, working an insane schedule because don't forget, we're all doing this off the side of our desks. We are 100% volunteer. Nobody was getting paid to do any of this. So coordinating this was out of the passion that we had and the, and the, the desire for these individuals to come home safely. And so the planning began and then we understood Cansoft is going to be deployed. Awesome. We started a campaign to get behind that. So Shemogs uh, for Afghanistan to really get behind the effort to get our people out. So uh, picking people up in the middle of the city, bring them into the airport, getting them through. You know, we knew we had thousands. We knew we only had five C-17s. The math wasn't looking good. And so there was a lot of hope there. And that for those few days was what we hung on to was that hope. And then we slowly started to see that we weren't getting nearly as many people through as, as we would like. There were some really positive images. Don't get me wrong. We had a, you know, image that's been uh, publicized in the media where, you know, we had a C-17 full, just like the Americans had their C-17 full, you know, standing room only essentially, which was a stark contrast to what we saw before, which was, you know, C-17 with barely 200 people in it getting off in, uh, in Toronto where we were wondering why so few people. Um, so, we started to get our act together. Now, what really isn't well understood um, for a lot of people is what was going on on the ground for these people to get out of Afghanistan. Now, the reason why we didn't get nearly as many people out is essentially due to a really, really poor bureaucracy and, and really poor handling of a crisis. So what didn't happen was a sense of urgency. We didn't look at this as, oh my God, we need to get as many people out as possible. 
let's put all this bureaucratic nonsense away. Let's get rid of the, this red tape. Let's get rid of this long form that Afghans need to fill out. Let's actually give them a chance to get out and do all that stuff in Canada or in Qatar or in Kuwait, literally anywhere else but Afghanistan. If by some chance we pick up a few Taliban on the way or a few, you know, terrorist actors, okay, you know what? We have the agencies here in Canada that can deal with that. The handful that may come over, I think is worth saving the thousands that we could potentially uh, have an effect on here. And unfortunately, that came a little bit too late. It was too little, too late. The requirements for biometrics, the uh, confusion about passports, the lack of visas. These were all things that just held back our efforts so, so much. Our ambassador just leaving and not staying behind like the British ambassador who was hand filling visa applications for his people. Where was ours? Our embassy was closed. We left staff behind. What happened here? We, we did something that, in my opinion, was just cut. We just cut and run and then abandoned all hope and then figured, oh, wait, maybe we should go back and actually clean up our mess. For me, this is, this is unacceptable. I mean, as a Canadian, I mean, I grew up with heroes, right? Like, you know, we had our hockey heroes. We had, you know, Gretzky, Lemieux, guys like Terry Fox. You know, we had the images of, you know, Vimy Ridge, Normandy. You know, Canadians are perceived as heroes. We're perceived as shock troops. We're perceived as brave. But this was not the Canada I grew up in. We, we left people behind. We left Canadians behind. So it was very hard to take. And I think we're coming to grips with the fact that we don't have a government that can actually work under stress. When you have departments that are infighting, when you have departments that can't get their act together, when they don't want to listen to people like us that actually have a plan that can actually help because for whatever reason, we don't have the credentials or we don't have the bureaucratic expertise to get things done. This is, this is something that just dumbfounded a lot of us and has ultimately cost a lot of lives and will cost more lives. And although we did save a few thousand, there's a few thousand more that we could have saved. And I think that was just because of a lack of give a shit factor. So getting closer to the 28th of August attack at the Abbey Gate, there were images that we were getting and, and you know, real time essay of, you know, mothers showing up to our troops begging for them to take their babies. In particular, one Afghan woman named Sophia who begged our own soldiers to take her two young children. If they weren't going to save her, at least save them. And reading this real time, seeing the pictures real time, and then realizing that our troops didn't do anything i i i just have no words and and i don't want you to think that i'm shitting on our troops because i'm not what i who i am shitting on is the leadership because as we all know and as you know if you've ever served you act out orders you act on orders and if you're standing outside the gate and your orders are sit tight don't let anybody in regardless of their situation, why well, are you going to sit tight and not let anybody in because those are your orders, aren't they? To me, I, I don't know how those troops, and I, I've, I've seen some of the, some of the reports um, from you know, third parties that uh, apparently have talked to some of those troops. They're shattered, and rightly so. Some of my friends who served in Bosnia during the bad days I heard their stories. They couldn't do anything when the villages were getting massacred. That doesn't do anything good for your mental health, I can tell you that much. As a human, as a man, you're trained to protect and kill, 
and now you're presented with a situation where you could save lives and especially babies and you can't i'm just at a loss and it wasn't like other countries weren't out in the middle of the of the fray with their armed forces helping women and children helping them get into the airport it was us for whatever reason we weren't given that latitude and I feel sorry for those those troops that had to go through that. That that to me, I, I mean, for me, Afghanistan was was a hell of a place to be. But the hardest thing for me was not being able to protect all those kids, um, and not being able to protect their families as, as well as I wish I could have. Um, and to be presented with that right in front of your face, I can only imagine what they're going through right now. To have to go home and and live with that, I can't be easy. And so this woman, Sophia, had to leave after waiting in a wadi full of shit with her two children because her husband had already been killed by the Taliban. Not getting a chance, even though she was a visa holder, to get out of the country. I, I mean, we've lost contact. We don't know her fate right now. And these are the kind of things that plague me, plague a lot of us that had to work in this situation that did what we could do knowing full well that there was going to be some awful stories come out of this. So this is, this, this is just a snapshot of uh, a small portion of stories of my story that, that I'm aware of. There's dozens of us, and I'm sure there's hundreds more that we don't know about because you're fighting your own private war over Facebook Messenger with your interpreter, wondering, hell, how am I going to get you out? Not having the resources to do so. But in the hour of need, realizing that maybe we aren't going to do anything. So I'm hoping that a lot more positive stories come out of this. I wish there were photos of Canadian soldiers, you know, helping children during that time in the airport. But unfortunately, I haven't seen any. I've seen plenty of others from other countries. So this is... For me, an example just of a, a complete collapse of leadership from the top down. And if we're going to move forward as a country, we have to address these things. Where do we, where do we point our disappointment? Where do we, where do we aim our, our contempt, our, our anger? Our political leadership is a reflection of us. So I think we have to point it inwards. We have to look at what is the reason what are the reasons for us having this inability for our government to actually do the right thing this was a win 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 there's nobody that could view this unless you are some stark raving racist that didn't want brown people in their country so you can go in your corner and think that but for the majority of canadians bringing these individuals home these allies that work for us these interpreters that kept us alive over there that wanted a better country for themselves and believed in Canada. This is a win. Bring them over. Spare no cost. Let's do it. We should have done it earlier. That's on us. Let's get, make it happen. And unfortunately we didn't have that. We didn't have that mentality. And then when the time came to actually implement a plan, it was one bungled effort after another. And private efforts had to step in and fill the gap. Why is that? Why is it that it's not just us? Why is it that across the planet, the Americans, the British, efforts had to be undertaken by private citizens to make this happen? I don't know. I don't know what's going on. There, there, there's, there's too much chaos and 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 too big of a leadership vacuum for this to be a coincidence. I think there's, we, have to be, we have to really, really look deep down inside as to what's wrong with our, with our countries, our respective countries, and in our case, Canada. How can we let this go on? We need answers. We need people to be accountable. We need people to take extreme ownership of the situations. And at no point did anybody say, this is on me. Our prime minister and any of our ministers never said that once. You know, and being a veteran, 
having responsibility drilled into us from day one. If you screw up, I screwed up. Check. I'm not going to let it happen again. All right, cool. Carry on. That's what we learned from day one on our, our basic courses. Don't say sorry. Just don't let it happen again. But where is that from our leadership? It's nowhere to be found. And this is the, this is the troubling part that, and the big takeaway from this. We don't have responsibility that runs all the way up to the top. And this is what I'm hoping to, to bring to light. What was impressive from the last few months is that our organization, and I'm speaking about the Afghan Canadian Interpreters Organization, was truly a plurality of what Canada represents. We had zero political ideology. We had members from the Liberal Party of Canada, the Conservative Party of Canada, the Green Party of Canada, veterans, public servants, members of Canadian Armed Forces, retired individuals, individuals in their 20s, individuals in their 70s. We all knew that this was the right thing to do. So egos were checked at the door. And we went to work. And I think this is leading to a, a very important veteran awakening. Because judging by the conversations I'm having with friends that I deployed with, they're asking, what the fuck is going on? What happened? Why, why is my interpreter writing me now? Like, I thought this was covered off. And realizing that, no, it's not. But we're doing something about it. And we're getting effects on the ground. We actually have outcomes with a small team, with a team that's actually dedicated to do something with no, no other interests other than saving lives. I think people have gotten jaded, gotten cynical that somehow we're benefiting financially or benefiting politically from this when in fact none of us are. Not a single person got paid here. Not a single person had any political agenda. We were literally just doing this because this was the right thing to do. It was the right thing for Canada to do. And so I'm thinking long-term that this is going to have a, a ripple effect. I think veterans are going to realize that we're a lot more important than we think we are. We're going to have a lot greater impact on society than I think we expect it to. We're the adults in the room. We're the ones holding the line. We're the ones that are fixing things that need fixing. And I hope this is the case moving forward. And I hope if you're listening to this and you're a veteran and you think, Matt, what can I do? I'm just a veteran. Exactly. You're a veteran. You're one of the few people in the country that has actually understood what it is to sacrifice, that actually understands what it is to take ownership, to know that your actions are more important than your words. That's why we need veterans like you, if you're listening to this, to take a stand. Make a positive impact in your community. You don't have to get involved in this, but there are a lot of other things that need our input. We are the ones that fought the wars for the last 15, 20 years. We're not owed anything, but we do have a very, very influential voice. We do have a perspective that most Canadians don't have. So take that to heart. So where can we improve? From what I can see, and this is having just experience as to what was going on at the ground level. We gave our, I guess, our our hard-earned data on loads of Afghan interpreters and those that work for us during the war, um, we created a very robust list. And we handed that over to the immigration department. Um, From there, things started to fall apart because they no longer wanted us to be consulted for whatever reason. And what that did was cause a duplication of effort. Whether that was due to ego, whether that was just due to incompetence, we don't don't know and I don't know if we will ever know. But moving forward, 
I think there's going to be a lot more efforts in the coming years just based on how society is shaking out, just based on how large bureaucracies and organizations are unable, unable to be agile and move and change with the times. It's going to be important for the larger organizations to look at the smaller organizations and use their good ideas to actually get things done. This is the world of the future. So if we can learn anything from this, just because you're a small organization doesn't mean you're incompetent, doesn't mean you don't know what you're doing. I think the paradigm that we are living in right now is one that was created from 100 years ago where the governing authority has all the power, has all the resources, has the ability to move and has the ability to get things done. When in reality, now the power has shifted to small decentralized groups like ours, which had a team that was cobbled together from all over Canada and the world and primarily communicated through social media and messenger platforms. The requirements on the bureaucratic level for individual Afghans to get out was unbearable. Biometrics, the form filling, the ultimatums of getting them done in 72 hours, printing forms, having PDF formats. These things were advised against, but they were still implemented because that's the process. And so we can see here that there's that rigidity again. And once the Taliban took over, all of a sudden, these processes were no longer required. And all of a sudden, we saw visas being expedited, but it was too late. It was far too late. So the process only started really once the shit hit the fan. And that tells me that there was just a lack of a sense of urgency. Individuals probably didn't understand the gravity that their, their actions were, were having on the ground. And that's the unfortunate reality of a large bureaucracy. And so how do we solve that issue? I don't have the answers. There's a lot smarter people and maybe you are one of those very smart people that has a much better answer. But ultimately, when the next crisis hits, we need to learn from what this one provides, which is a lot of actionable advice, info, as to how to improve our bureaucracies and how to improve our government and what to expect from our government moving forward. When the people demand something, we have to be able to execute. And so moving forward, there are a few things that you can do to help this effort. If you want to donate to a fund that is helping individuals that are setting the conditions up for success to get Afghans out of Afghanistan, you can head to the VTN Afghan Fund. So that's the Veteran Transition Networks Afghan Fund. So those links or that specific link, I will have on my website. So on the podcast link to this episode, you'll, you'll have that link. Additionally, if you would like to contribute to the resettlement of Afghans here in Canada, you can go to the True Patriot Love Afghan Fund. And again, that link will be in the show notes and in the link uh, on my podcast page so that you can donate there as well. These two efforts are uh, full-blown Canadian charities, so they are legitimate and you will get a tax receipt. Um, the cool thing about the VTN fund is that uh, you can have an impact on the ground at the tactical level to help these individuals leave the country. And for me, that is my main effort right now. For others, they're looking at the resettlement side of things, which is just as important because these families are going to need support because the Canadian government only gives so much support for so long. And having generous Canadians donate and having corporations who already have donate to this fund is going to set them up for long-term success. And that's exactly what we want. And if you've fought over there or worked over there, you know damn well how crafty Afghans are. They're going to be a very, very important piece of our Canadian tapestry moving forward. I'm, on my end, my interpreter is actually in the UK right now, and he's uh, getting himself set up in a brand new world, in a brand new city, and uh, 
I'm doing my best to to help him and support him, even though we're an ocean away. Um, the world is still a small place when uh, when you have access to the internet. So, um, just to end things on a really bright note, having that first conversation with my interpreter uh, once he'd landed in the UK, once he's set up in a hotel with his kids and his wife, um, I'd only seen him for the last ten years um, in Afghanistan when he would call. And uh, rarely via video chat, just because the internet wasn't so good. So occasional photos here and there. But uh, having worked with him for quite a while while I was deployed, um, when he called that that day from from the UK, I, I'd never seen his face so happy. And to see a man's face with the 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 just the 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 happiness and the the signs of relief and just the the his eyes just being so bright and happy and hearing his kids laugh in the background um it was definitely pretty emotional i can i can tell you that much and um it was one of those things where you know as much as as much as i would have liked to have had greater success and more individuals and literally everyone on our list make it here in canada during that last volley of of c-17 flights Ultimately, my biggest concern was getting my interpreter out, and that was the initial that was the initial mission. So I need to accept those those wins, and this was a big one. And uh, he was the he was the impetus for me getting involved in this in the first place. And to see him safe with his immediate family is uh, was a real big uh, boost to morale. And and for those of you that that have interpreters that did get out and have made it to Canada you know, appreciate that moment. And those that are still there would not want you to, to live in regret and sorrow for them. They'd want you to live as, as amazing a life as possible and keep on fighting. Don't get down okay, keep the fight up. We can keep on getting people out. It's not a done deal. And that's my biggest message to you. If you're listening, keep up the fight. We're still in this. We're still behind Every Afghan that's still in Afghanistan, the government is still working on this. We are still working on this. And if you are an Afghan and you are listening to this, okay, we're not leaving you behind. Simple as that. So for me, that's all for today. Pretty heavy episode, but nevertheless, one that had to get done. Uh, not only for uh, you to understand where we're coming from as an organization, but uh, for me for for me to get this out and and uh, to have a platform to be able to actually talk about this and have a post-mortem uh, as we move on to our next phase uh, it's equally as important so i just want to thank you for listening and stay tuned for more episodes as they come through and don't forget train hard fight easy peace <laughs>